Vice Mayor Susan Jacobowski, and I would like to call to order the special meeting noticed for today. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. May we have the roll call, please? Council Member Wong? He's Council here, Member muted. Wong? <laughs> I thought I'm, I'm here. Thank you. Council Member Shepard Rami? Here. Council Member Talt? Here. Vice Mayor Jacobowski? Here. Mayor Udy's not here. Thank you. Thank you. The special meeting agenda is posted 24 hours prior to each special meeting at the following locations. City Hall, the Crowell Public Library, and the Recreation Department. The special meeting is also meeting agenda is also posted on the city's website. The city welcomes public input. At this time, the public may address the city council on items that are not on the agenda. Pursuant to state law, the city council may not discuss or take action on issues not on the meeting agenda. To ensure that everyone, including those joining us remotely, are able to hear the speakers clearly, please speak directly into the microphone. Please note that all comments are limited to three minutes and will be timed by city staff. I would now like to ask City Clerk Baker to explain how public comment will work for each agenda item. Thank you, Vice Mayor. For uh, each agenda item, there will be an opportunity for public comment. Uh, we will take public comment in two ways since this is a virtual meeting. You can either email um, a request to speak to city clerk at cityofsanmarino.org, or you can use the raise hand feature on Zoom, which is at the bottom right hand side, and you can click that or send me a message directly through chat. Please wait until that item has been called to raise your hand. That way I know you're asking to speak for that particular item. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone we wish to speak at this time? Um, if so, please signify by one of the methods method mentioned. Do uh, we have any other requests that are electronic? I'm not seeing any requests for comment at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, today we are discussing uh, one agenda item only, the housing element workshop. And I would like to request that we begin with an introduction from Director Cervantes, please. Thank you. And thank you, Vice Mayor, for the introduction and uh, welcome council members, uh, members of the public and staff. Uh, I want to introduce uh, the lead uh, project planners for this project. And of course, it's Eva Choi, who's our associate planner, who is the project manager for this housing element, and Jane Riley of Four Leaf, uh, who has helped us tremendously on this project. And we thank her every single time we have an opportunity. <laughs> so on her efforts with this project, it's been a wonderful, wonderful project uh, working alongside her and her team. And so... This is now my third housing element for the city of San Marino, and, and uh, they've all been equally exciting, but this one's also very exciting because of Jane and her work. And so uh, I want to now turn the presentation over to Jane. Uh, she will be leading the discussion, pre presenting the staff reports, and going through a, a very thorough uh, PowerPoint presentation of all the, the facts and details of what we've been looking for uh, in the next housing element cycle. So Jane, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Aldo. Appreciate all your kind words. Uh, you guys are awesome to work with, too. That's what makes me so nice. <laughs> so, good morning. Hope everyone has their coffee or their tea. <clears throat> Excuse me. I hope I can sound coherent at this hour of the day. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Jane Riley. As Aldo mentioned, I'm with Four Leaf, and I help communities write their housing elements. 
I have a little longer agenda than you do today. <laughs> and um, I'll be covering each of these things, but I'll do so fairly quickly. Some of you who heard the Planning Commission presentation will have heard some of this before, but we do have new information, more demographics and the final survey results that I'll be presenting today as well. So I've been working on housing elements since the second cycle, and this is the sixth cycle. So even more than all those stuff. <laughs> Uh, this six cycle is completely different than anything that's come before it. And it's really gonna be a struggle and a challenge. And I, I like a challenge, so that's great. Let's, let's get into it. Um, before I begin, I wanted to define for you what affordable housing is. In the simplest terms, housing is affordable when you don't have to pay more than 30% of your monthly income for it. Affordable with a capital A, means that deed restricted housing units that have limits on rent and income. And it, we're generally talking about housing that's affordable to households with incomes that are less than the LA County median, which is $77,300 for a family of four, not very much. This slide shows the county's income limits for each group. And across the bottom, I've put the affordable rents, what's affordable to each of those income groups in green and affordable sales prices in blue. On the far right are San Marino's current median housing prices. So you can see that they're nowhere near affordable for people in these income groups. The peach column on the far right provides sample occupations for each income group. I want you to notice that from preschool teachers and Huntington scholars through paramedics, firefighters, appraisers, and police, these are the people that need affordable housing. There are many, many requirements for housing elements, um, much more than we can talk about today. So I'm gonna walk through this first part pretty briefly. I'm always available for questions. All jurisdictions must plan for their housing needs and they must adopt a housing element as a chapter of their general plans. Housing elements need to include a site inventory showing sites that are adequate to meet your regional needs. They need policies and programs to promote housing development an analysis of the constraints to housing development and a review of how well you did implementing your last housing element. There are also new requirements related to affirmatively furthering fair housing in your community. I wanna just emphasize the first bullet on this slide. It's a jurisdiction statutory obligation to adequately plan for existing and projected housing needs for all economic segments of the community. Unlike other general plan elements, the housing element is required to undergo review by the State Department of Housing and Community Development, which I will refer to as HCD. And that's for compliance with state law, which is commonly called certification. Okay, let's jump into regional housing needs, commonly called the RENA. The RENA has increased astronomically all over California, but especially here in the Skag region. Cities must plan for and zone for their arenas, but they are not obligated to build it. The legislature's intent here is that cities always have enough land zoned at high enough densities for a developer to come in and build the housing. Most cities aren't in the business of building housing and we depend on private developers in the market to do that. San Marino's arena is 397 units, including 240 units affordable to lower income households. San Marino got a lot more of the affordable side of the arena because they are considered a very high opportunity jurisdiction. So this is what the process looks like. SCAG, the Southern California Association of Governments has provided your arena and now we're here in the gray box, updating your housing element to accommodate that arena and meet your community needs. We're gonna work closely with HCD to produce an element that can be certified because certification is important. It provides a presumption of validity and a legal challenge. It keeps the attorney general off your back and it allows you to retain local control over housing projects. Some of the reasons for HCD certification are shown on this slide, but um, I'm, I'm gonna ask and answer the question that you may not want to. That's uh, what happens if we don't do it? What happens if the city doesn't adopt a housing element that can be certified? Or if they do adopt one, what happens if they just blow it off and don't do any of the stuff in it? Well, if a city breaks the law, it can be sued. Fines in this kind of case would run up to about $300,000 a month and that's before any attorney's fees, which are very costly. A court may take away your land use authority until your housing element is in compliance. If your land use authority is taken from you, 
you'll lose the right to approve building permits, even for things like kitchen and bathroom remodels that your residents want. You might be unable to deny housing projects, even if they're inconsistent with your general plan and zoning, because if your land use authority is taken away, then your general plan and zoning aren't valid anymore. A court gets to decide instead of you. So that's like the worst thing that can happen. So we want to be really keep that in mind how important certification is as we move through this process. I'll go over just a few demographics and pieces of census data where they reflect the things that we need to address in this housing element update. We have about 80 pages of this in the administrative draft housing element. You're welcome to look at it all, but I can't possibly cover it in a half hour presentation. So this chart shows the population trend in San Marino in five-year increments from 2000 to 2020. The blue is San Marino and the orange is the skag line. Over this period, San Marino grew a lot less than the region. And in the last five-year period, your population has declined. Your average household side has also declined and it's less than three persons for the first time. Three persons per household. This is one of those data sets that really shows how different San Marino is from the county as a whole. And this is something that we, we can't get SCAG or the other COGS to accept when there's establishing arenas for us. Um, the blue bars are San Marino and the further right you go, the older the housing stock is. San Marino has obviously been here for a long time. Most of its homes were built before 1940 or 50. The county on the other hand, didn't really hit its building peak until the 1970s. And San Marino was pretty built out before then. Over here on the left, you can see that no one has been building anything since 2010, which is a big part of why we're in a housing crisis now. This slide's related to that last one. San Marino is almost exclusively single family homes. It's 99% of its housing stock as compared to the region 62%. A lot of that's because of when San Marino was built out and why it was built. The vacancy rate here is 4.6% which is on the low side of a healthy vacancy rate. You wanna look at around 5%. There were, as of this uh, 2019 Department of Finance report, 207 vacant units in San Marino. Of those 207 vacant units, census data reflects that 67% of them, that's 139 units, are vacant because of other, including the personal reasons of the owner. That's way more than the region overall. That's 3% of your housing stock, which makes your true vacancy rate about 1.6%. That's far too low. It further drives up prices, and it means people who want to live in San Marino will have a really difficult time finding housing here, even if they can't afford it. So this slide of all of them really tells San Marino's story. These, these are bars in five-year cohorts, and they're already three years old. So imagine with the housing element period being eight years, each of these Five foot five, five year cohort bars is going to shift up two spaces or 10 years. So the big blurb that's over here at the 60 to 64 is going to move over to the 70, 74, and so, so on for the ones behind it. So everything will kind of move forward. Same thing's going to happen down here where the 10 to 20s are going to move into this category. But this category of the, the young people starting out is small because they can't afford to live in San Marino. So we see two housing needs from the slide that we need to plan for. One is that aging population, and we'll talk about that quite a bit. And the other is this cohort of younger people who you will lose the San Marino residents if you can't find a way to provide an affordable way for them to live here. Quickly, this slide shows your elderly households. Uh, homeowners are in blue, renters are in orange. This includes very low and extreme low income seniors. While San Marino is a very affluent community, you need to know that almost 36% of your elderly are considered low income or less and most own their homes. So that's an, another housing need that you're gonna need to plan for. The state law also requires that we analyze and plan for persons with disabilities. There are 461 persons in the city that have a disability that doesn't allow them to live independently. Another, there's 413 with ambulatory disabilities, 248 cannot perform self-care and so on. These aren't cumulative numbers. These are, re there are residents who show up in more than one category because they have more than one type of disability. But the point is that you have disabled residents and you have an aging population. And so you can expect to have even more aging related disabilities as you move forward in the next eight years. And again, we need to plan for that. 
So I'm going to jump to the community survey results. We issued the community surveys in <clears throat> three languages, English, Chinese, and Spanish. We did receive them back in all three languages, which always makes me very happy. The surveys had five main questions. The biggest housing needs facing San Marino today, top two needs identified were housing for a lower price range and homes for first time home buyers. So that seems consistent with what we saw in the census data, right? The next most popular answer, however, was all of San Marino's housing needs are being met. There is a sizable portion of your residents who do not feel that San Marino has any unmet housing needs and do not want to see change. That's normal. Thinking years ahead, what will the city's housing needs be? And your residents have really thought about this. Number one answer, older homes will need rehabilitation or repair. Again, consistent with what we see on the census data showing that most homes are built before the 40s and 50s. Next two answers also reflect what we saw in the chart that shows how no young adults can live in San Marino. Housing will need to be priced to attract new families to San Marino and housing will need to be priced so that my children can afford to live here. Your residents also noted that our aging population will need accessible, well-designed housing options. Census data agrees. This question was an interesting one. This asked residents to rank their level of agreement with certain statements. The green reflects agreement and the red reflects disagreement. And these are value ranked from the left to the right. The first bar, the highest level of agreement is that it's important to preserve San Marino's neighborhoods. The second bar, it's important to preserve its historic architecture. Third is some of the older homes need maintenance. Fourth, no entry level homes. Fifth, seniors need help to stay in their homes and so on. My, wor my workers can't afford to live here. My kids can't afford to live here. So the state, uh, that's you know pretty consistent with what we saw with census. The statement that most disagreed was over here on the end with the big red bar is that some apartments should be built in San Marino. High level of disagreement with that even though the state requires it. But when we phrase that question a little differently and, and said, no apartment should be allowed unless they look like single family homes, we got a much different answer and we got slightly more agreement than disagreement. So that tells us something about how we need to plan for the apartment zoning that the state requires us to do. This question asked residents to rank the type of new housing that they thought would be most successful in San Marino today. Number one, eighties and JDUs, accessory dwelling units and junior accessory dwelling units. Number two, small homes and cottages. Number three, independent senior living. <clears throat> the last question was open-ended and asked residents about the opportunities for housing that they saw in San Marino. This is just a word cloud of the open answers and the words that appeared most frequently. You have um, full answers in the planning commission attachments to the staff reports. There's some really great ideas from your community members. I encourage you to look at all of them. And a lot of them are about allowing and encouraging mixed use, as you can tell from this word cloud, housing and commercial areas. I'm gonna to jump to the next topic, which is the new laws and what makes things so different this time. I am not an attorney and specific questions should be posed to your city attorney, but let's look at what has happened in Sacramento since the last housing element. This, this is me in the middle. This is an incomplete table of recent laws affecting housing and housing elements. A more complete table is provided as an attachment to that planning commission staff report and it includes links to the actual legislation. <clears throat> I'm not gonna cover all of those today, only a few of them. So the site's inventory was always gonna be problematic for San Marino before AB 137 was adopted, just because you're fully built out and your arena can't possibly accommodate it on the one vacant site that you have left. AB 1397 added even more requirements for housing element sites, including a strong justification if non-vacant sites are included. And because we have nothing but non-vacant sites to work with, we're going to have to come up with that strong justification to convince HCD that we're doing the best we can. 1397 strengthened and updated government code 65580, which is the primary housing element law. This law requires not just appropriate zoning to meet your arena, but it also requires that you zone for all types of housing. That includes multifamily rental, ownership, apartments, duplexes, triplexes, and so on. So you can't just meet your need in ADUs. This table lays out some of the specific changes that 1397 made that sharply decreased the sites that we can list in inventory. 
It also includes the new fair housing law about where the sites need to go. So let's talk for just a minute about how density plays into this housing element update. The statute says you have to zone enough sites at appropriate densities to meet your arena. So what's appropriate, even for a small town like this? For the 240 lower income households that you have arena for, it means a density of at least 20 units per acre. If San Marino had some development experience with affordable housing and could demonstrate affordability using lower density, then you would be able to use that lower density. But you lack that experience, and so you're stuck using the state default density, which again is a minimum of 20 units per acre. So here's the bottom line. At the same time that Arena got exponentially larger, the number of sites that now qualify for the inventory got a whole lot smaller. SB 166 is the no net loss law. It basically says that any site listed in your housing inventory that develops differently than how it was listed has to be replaced within six months unless you still have enough sites in inventory to meet your remaining arena. I think we all know that it's pretty much impossible to identify sites, go through the public process, go through the CEQA process and rezone within six months. So I'm gonna recommend that you not get yourselves into that jam. Zone more sites than you need, at least 130% of the arena shortfall, if not 130% of the arena. We'll talk about that in a minute. It's important to know that non-compliance with this no net loss law is one of the reasons that the HCD can now refer you to the attorney general under SB 35. This is where the attorney general comes in. I'm, I'm sorry, under AB 72. So AB 72 is a big one. It gives HCD broad authority that they have not had in the past. They can revoke compliance and certification of your housing element at any time that they find you're not doing what they think you're supposed to do. And this is important. They can refer any case to the attorney general for non-compliance with any of the five things listed on this slide. And these are really broad ranging, housing element law, anti-discrimination laws, density bonus, et cetera. So just about anything. So now SB 35, you may be familiar with this one. This basically says that housing projects with an affordable component are allowed ministerially. No discretion is allowed on the part of the local official, period. So they can only look, if Eva gets a project at the counter, she can only look at those adopted objective design standards that were in place when the application came in. So when Eva and Aldo come to you and say, please adopt these objective design standards, I, I want you to really believe them because that's going to be very important in the future. Right now you're not subject, but the planning cycle starts again next year and you will once again be subject to this law. Finally, AB 686, AKA the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing or AFFH bill. As you're all aware, housing demand is far outpacing housing supply. But the supply solution isn't just about how many units are built. It's also about where they are built and who has access to them. Your housing element needs to overcome existing patterns of segregation, this is the new law, and increase access to opportunity for all community members. It means that cities need to zone at high enough densities for low income housing in high resource areas. Those are the areas with the best schools and the best parks and health outcomes. Obviously, San Marino is a very high resource area. In addition to the socioeconomic data, the housing element needs to identify any patterns of segregation, which we actually didn't find in San Marino. It's a very well integrated community. Affirmatively furthering fair housing has a legal definition that's printed on this slide that's pretty thick. Pretty much the housing element has to analyze exclusionary land use practices and include programs to eliminate them. This includes the city's long history of exclusive single family zoning. By definition, that is an exclusionary land use practice and the city has to allow other types of residential uses like duplexes and apartments. The housing element is required to contain programs to eliminate those exclusionary practices. Okay, that's a lot of information. So how do we take all these pieces and the requirements and the arena and the community interests and the housing needs that we've identified in your community and create a housing element? I mean, where do we even start? <clears throat> so I wanna look at the project objectives. They're on this slide. 
So I'm a confessed housing policy wonk. I love this stuff. I'm also a housing advocate. I think everyone deserves good, decent housing. And I'm gonna work really hard to ensure that your housing element meets those state requirements and can be certified by the state. But it's really important you understand this. Your most important job, the most important thing for you is to identify and address your specific community needs. Not just jump to what the state wants, but address your needs. And those two things aren't mutually exclusive. We can work together and create programs that are gonna fit both the state requirements and the identified needs in your community. That's what's really important. Identifying adequate sites is going to be the big challenge. You're gonna to need to commit to considering sites and to rezoning for a certain number of units to meet your shortfall. Choosing more policy options to include in the housing strategy will allow a broader range of options to meet those inventory requirements. Because it's likely that HCD is going to want more than I'm going to be offering them in the first round. So let's look back to your local housing needs that we've identified with the census data and the demographics and the community input. Seniors and their unique needs. Again, this is a big one. That cohort slide that I showed you with the young adult population that you'll continue to lose if you don't address the lack of housing for families that are just starting out. And school enrollment is going to continue to decline if you can't do that. Aging housing stock assistance may be needed there. Then there's the whole issue of vacant homes they might, that might not really be in your housing stock. The city might want to look into that and protect its housing from being used for other purposes. Some community desires will run up against state requirements, but others don't. It's very important to your residents to maintain the character and feel of the residential neighborhoods and its historic architecture as much as possible. So if we agree that it's important to maintain the physical form and character of the neighborhoods that make San Marino what it is, then the density has to go somewhere else and the only other place is the C1. Mixed use may be controversial, but it's gonna help protect your neighborhoods. Some community needs and desires will align well with the state requirements, others do not. The community doesn't want to see apartments built, the state requires you to zone for them. The big issue again is going to be that difficulty of identifying adequate sites to achieve your HCD approval and certification. So this is going to be a balancing act, just like every other land use matter that you have before you. And I put the balance scale on the slide to reflect that, but I think it's going to be more likely that you're going to feel like this. Let's move on to the draft housing strategy. The housing element itself is in four sections as shown on this slide. Today, I'm asking for you to consider and provide direction on section two, which is the housing strategy. That's the policy meat of the document. The direction that you provide for the policies and programs that go into section two are gonna determine section three. It'll help you determine your arena shortfall and how many sites you need to rezone to accommodate that need. I've taken kind of an all-in kitchen sink approach and included a lot of new programs for the city to consider over the next three years. And I welcome any additional ideas that you may have because we're gonna to need to do more. Again, the more programs that you decide to include in your strategy, the more options you're gonna have when it comes time to really rezone sites. I wanna be clear that you're committing to rezone sites within three years. You have to get it done within three years or you'll be out of certification. Of the 397 arena unit obligation, up to 290 units could be accommodated with A dues, J dues, and residentially zoned sites under current zoning. That would leave a shortfall of 107 units that have to be planned for and accommodated by rezoning and zoning code changes within the next three years. Because of the new no net loss laws, you need to rezone for more than that. Assuming that all of the policies and programs in the draft strategy were adopted and assuming that HCD agrees to my rather aggressive ADU projections, this is what your arena shortfall and rezoning needs might look like. And to do that, we would have to do everything on this slide, which I won't go into, it's in the document. On to the policy options. I'm gonna start with the options that will apply in residential areas and then move on to those that are applicable in commercial areas. San Marino can meet a lot of its arena through A dues, but it isn't allowed to meet all of it that way. But I recommend that you make as much use of A dues and J dues as possible because they meet so many of your identified community needs, many of which are shown on this slide. Again, that's the most important thing that I want you to consider. There are a pre-certified set of affordability assumptions for A dues. Uh, SCAG did a survey and 
um, eight city has accepted this and pre-certified it. So the question isn't how affordable they're going to be. The question is how many can we count on producing? HCD allows us to assume current levels of 80 production, which was about 20 last year, but it's increasing quickly. If we adopt new programs to promote and incentivize more ADUs, then HCD will consider allowing more of them to count. My numbers are pretty aggressive at 40 the first year, kind of accommodate the pent up demand, 30 the second year, and then about 25 per year for the remainder, remainder of the sixth cycle. That's 221 ADUs. I'm also assuming 20 JDUs, junior accessory dwelling units, over the sixth cycle. The city's only finaled one so far, I think. So new programs would be needed to help increase their production. Missing middle housing. This is kind of a buzz term right now. Um, a lot of cities are talking about this and the loss of single family zoning and so on. You can take this, progr this program as far as you want it. You could allow cottage courts, you could allow low rise apartments, you can start small and stick to duplexes and triplexes, their interior conversions of existing homes, which is what I've got in the, in the uh, strategy. The state already requires you to allow an ADU plus a JDU plus a, an ADU plus a JDU on a home with a single, on a lot with a single family home, that's three units already. You're already required to do that, to allow that if someone proposes it in a residential area. That program could be an alternative to a different allowance. You could either do the A do J do thing within the size limitations of state law, or the city could offer a different program to do an interior conversion of up to three units, but this one would be subject to design standards or design review. And it would, it would ensure that the units still look like a single family home from the street design standards would still apply. You could allow the division into a fourplex with a use permit and design review if you wanted. The draft program in the housing strategy is for a triplex in a limited area near Mission Street. That's what the planning commission was looking at, but you can do whatever you want and put it wherever you want. Many communities are moving in this direction. On this slide, I have two fourplexes and a duplex. They all look like single family homes. Universal design is a great option to address some of your identified local needs, namely your aging population with some disabilities and some mobility issues. These needs are only gonna increase over the next 15 years. Universal design is a good idea for all of us and it's simple to promote. Retrofitting homes is expensive, but building them to these standards in the first place is much cheaper. And if you were to include universal design features in say pre-approved ADU plans, then you've just made the right way, the easy way, which is like a basic tenet of land use planning, make the right way, the easy way, and then you'll get what you want. So moving on to the commercial areas, the way we can best protect the residential neighborhoods that make San Marino what it is, is to put density into the commercial areas. There are a number of ways to do this. I just wanna point out that residential uses are already allowed in the commercial zone. Mixed use is already allowed. Artist studios are already allowed. But in order for these units to count towards any part of your affordable arena, you'd need to get to your default density of at least 20 units per acre. The easiest way to do that would be by making a simple zoning change to decrease the amount of lot area required per unit. <clears throat> the potential issue with this approach would be that that kind of development could then happen on any C1 parcel, which you have all over Huntington and, and Mission. If a project is providing 20% of its units is affordable, you would need to allow it by right. If it's market rate project, you could still get a use permit for it. Another option that gives the council a little more control over where these projects could be located would be an overlay zone that would require a reason to place it on any site. The overlay, and you can do this in a variety of ways, and they can meet a variety of identified needs, especially for families first starting out. It allows, an overlay would allow whatever the underlying zoning district allows or housing of whatever density you determine or both. There are a number of pros that it would provide maximum flexibility for business owners who may be facing some tough decisions coming out of the pandemic. The one bad side is that no net loss law. If sites are rezoned to apply this overlay and then they're developed as commercial uses or something else, then you would need to have adequate sites left in your inventory to accommodate your remaining need. So the next steps are to take public input today and please provide me direction on the policy options. 
I'll use that direction to complete the 8CD draft housing element, which will be released for public review before it goes to 8CD for their mandatory 60 day review. Once we get HCD's comments back, I'll incorporate them into a draft housing element for the Planning Commission's public hearing and a recommendation to the Council for your public hearing. Your Council must make findings and adopt an HCD reviewed housing element by October 15th to remain in compliance with the state law. This is my last slide. This reflects where we are in the process and what we have left to do. The orange dots are all the areas where public input is accepted and encouraged. I'll end my presentation here. I'm happy to answer questions and I hope we engage in some good discussion. So thank, thank you, you very much. Oh, go, go uh, ahead. Right no, now. I was going to ask Director Cervantes, um, how would you like to wrap up this part before we go on? Yeah, so uh, thank you, Vice Mayor, and thank you, Jane, for that, that thorough presentation. The, the steps that we're looking uh, uh, to make this an effective meeting is is really to obviously understand the 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 uh, the elements that were described in the presentation and to really pose questions to staff and Jane at this point. Uh, the next step, of course, would be to uh, open up the hearing. Uh, if there's anyone in the public who wants to provide comments about about what they just heard, uh, and lastly, to go through the goals that are identified in the staff report. Um, and to provide direction to staff as to the direction uh, in terms of the housing opportunities we are to look for in drafting sort of the next step of the housing element document. So step one is to really pose questions. Step two, open it up for any comments. And then step three, provide direction to staff and Jane. That way we can move forward on two things, two really critical pieces here. Number one is to finish the draft of the housing element with any or any or all of the directions provided uh, in the presentation and in the staff report in terms of housing opportunities. But most importantly, to trigger uh, staff's movement on creating those objective standards. Uh, uh, as you've heard in many council meetings, I've begun that process. And so uh, this morning, uh, given a direction of council, it would then direct me and our staff to start working on other um, objective standards uh, to place that in front of the planning commission and then eventually the city council. So those are the three steps that we're looking for this morning. Thank you very much. Um, why don't we then begin with questions? Um, why don't we start with council member Shepard Romy? I know you had um, the advantage as I did of hearing this before the planning commission, it doesn't necessarily make us more knowledgeable just having heard it once. Any questions? Uh, thank you, um, Vice Mayor Jacobowski, I appreciate it. And certainly even hearing it twice, there's a lot here to digest and um, seeing the report along with a proposed, which I believe is the direction um, recommended by staff that draft housing strategy. So I don't know, do you want me to um, focus on the actual document or on some of the issues that are listed here in the staff report? Um, may we please start first with questions and then move on in the next round to comments? All right. So, so they can be as broad as you'd like them. Okay. Uh, generally throughout the um, the staff report, I guess I have a question as to mixed use. I know um, our community is, um, as you said, I think the consultant said, um, Ms. Riley, that that's something that's important um, to our community to not move in the direction of, if we're talking about R1 and C1 in a combination building. So, sometimes, and I know I've asked Director Cervantes this, mixed use has a lot of um, different interpretations because mixed use is even, you know, uh, we talk about it in the commercial district exists right now, but that means there's a salon next to a doctor's office, next to a restaurant, next to whatever. So there's mixed use within a commercial category. And there's also mixed use, meaning a dual use of residential in commercial or vice versa. So some of the 
phrasing here, I need to see more specifically which one we're talking about. That's hard for me because I know there's different connotations to what we're saying. So some of the recommendations, I just wanted to understand what you mean or what is meant by mixed use throughout these documents. That's a great question and thanks for pointing out the need for that clarification. In every instance in these documents, I mean mixed use that combines residential uses with either commercial, industrial, office uses, some other type of use. All right, so thank you for that clarification. And also, sorry, now I understand about the um, exclusive, because of your presentation, exclusive single family zoning is an exclusionary land practice and that the city does not have other does not have other issues. The bigger other issue, I guess, is the affordability, which um, will be dealt with as we plan for different categories and homes. Is that correct? That's Those are the things that we are dealing with here. Absolutely, yes. Okay. And so to focus on those, um, I guess I looked at, I was looking at some of the policy options and I don't know if it would be helpful um, before we proceed to the actual document itself, you could direct us, we could talk about each goal at a time and which policy options that you describe, you know, you list and then you make recommendations maybe, and we could discuss option three, option one, or the combinant once we get to that point. But it's hard to talk about it all in one um, round. And I don't think anybody wants to hear um, or it, it, do it all at one person, one time. So I appreciate that you um, focused on our ADU and JADU and are being um, uh, are promoting that, if you will, not promoting it, but putting that out there as a good way to meet a significant number. And I'm hoping that also the um, concept of interior conversions, and I don't know if there's a limit as to, you know, if we go down the road of interior conversions or we um, do some of these things, are there limits in any other category? Because you said ADUs and JADUs can only account for a certain percentage. And I don't know if that applies to other type of new or adaptive uses that we might want to consider today. Another good question and a complex one, but I think it's important um, to, to deal with this question early. ADUs have sort of a special place where um, everyone was trying to claim that they're all for very low income, all the jurisdictions were, and we knew that wasn't the case. And so HCD has asked the regional councils of government to do those surveys to figure out what the, uh, what the affordability levels really are so that they would have a reasonable standard to apply. The test for anything else is realistic. It has to be realistic. And so what they're looking for is what's happening in your community, which you don't have yet, right? So what's happening in communities around you? So we could look at what's happening in Pasadena and we could look at what's happening in other nearby communities and see if a, if a single family home is divided into three homes, what do those rents then become? And I, I, I think not only does this meet a lot of your needs, but they're gonna meet an affordable uh, income level at moderate and middle income, which you're lacking. You don't have that and the ADUs aren't gonna do that for you under the calculations. So again, I wanna go back to the most important thing here is for you to plan for your housing needs. And these units will meet the needs of people who are just starting out. There's something that com your community really needs and we'll, we'll work out the affordability once you have a few of them, then we can demonstrate the affordability level. Right now, we can just give you a list. All right, thank you, that's helpful. And the other um, option for, you know, um, infill, if you will, is also, I, I think I've seen other cities and, and heard discussed, um, like Pasadena, for example, is this kind of a um, board and care facilities or introducing that you can add residential units, whether it be at a church site, a school site, you know, we have boarding, we have private school in town, and so that they could house their teachers perhaps, or even at the Huntington, they could house visiting scholars um, or even their own staff. And I know they already have a couple housing sites, obviously for the senior staff, but even, you know, um, working with them to maybe perhaps expand their offerings to other staff levels. 
So do those type of, um, I don't know what you, what category over overall you put those in, but to explore those options, which are, I guess, site specific rezoning or overlays. I don't know how to call it, but you limit it to certain things like churches, schools, cultural institutions, et cetera. I don't know if, um, how that is done. Is it an overlay zone and you limit it to certain types of commercial use properties or is it something else? I, I don't know how we would implement that um, in our city. Whew, that's like three questions in one. Okay. <laughs> um, I am proposing an overlay zone to do precisely that. The kinds of units that you're allowed to count would be, let's take the example of the school. For dormitory units, which are not individual units, they share kitchen facilities or bathrooms, those don't count. Those aren't individual units. So they have to meet a census definition of a unit. So they have to have a little kitchenette in the bathroom and a closet and a, a separate entry. Um, but they can, they also don't count if they're limited to um, just students, but they could count if, for example, you put housing on a school site to house teachers, those absolutely count and, and they're going to be at whatever affordability level we want. In order to provide the maximum flexibility for some of these, they're, they're really mixed uses, right? In order to provide the maximum flexibility for that, I am recommending that we use a workforce housing zone or affordable housing zone, whatever you want to call it, overlay, which the city council would have the opportunity to place those on the sites where it's appropriate. So you would write the standards for that overlay. You would put in the density range. Recognize that if it doesn't develop at a high enough density range, you're probably not going to get to the very low and low income. But that's not the only housing need you have. You have all that middle income housing need. So, so yes, I would recommend that you do that through an overlay zone. Churches can actually do that now if providing housing is one of the core missions of their church. So they, that's a first amendment, right? So um, some people are putting that on churches. A lot of churches are asking for that. Um, I've had some discussions with Aldo. He doesn't think that's the situation in this community, but you can certainly open it up to churches and allow them to request that overlay if that's something that they think they oh, might want to do. We can explore that option, yeah. Sure. And, um, then focusing on the capturing the extremely low, low, I can't remember the phraseology, phrase, um, but there's a whole scheme for it to capture mm -hmm. the lowest income levels. And I'm not sure how those can be absorbed unless you are in a, um, or best absorbed, unless you're talking about you know, the conversions, the JA to use, the perhaps other things. But my overarching concern is, or, or thought is, can we require, I know somewhere in here you talk about 20% of a new development or something would be in, in that category, I think. But can we require there's, that all of it has to be in that category or until no further development of these projects unless at all, because I don't know that we will ever get, I truly, um, ever get development here unless it has market rate. So we're gonna get more market rate, which doesn't help us satisfy any of these requirements and really doesn't help our youngest, whether it's young single, young family or seniors who are in fixed income, you know, those categories. It's, we're not answering their problem as long as we just add a lot of options in our town and we don't mandate a very high percentage, if not the whole project to be at certain income levels. And I don't know if that's something that we can do um, and how we go about doing it. Because I do think we need to focus on those goals. It's a high number and you know, past history is anything. People always build market rate. Right. So your shortfall for extremely low and low income units are 32 and 45 respectively. So that's pretty high. The rest of them we've made assumptions that were already certified by the state for ADUs and JDUs. That's the highest level that we can possibly, the very hardest thing to do. Um, I, we did as a part of our community outreach and our information gathering, we did um, plenty of stakeholder interviews with for-profit developers and with nonprofit developers. And the nonprofit developers pretty much told us unless you can get land prices down and do some lot um, combination programs, we're not gonna be able to come and build 100% affordable in your communities. 
The for profit developers, on the other hand, said we might be able to do a mixed income project in your community. You know, we'd have to make a deal and we'd have to get a pretty good land price, but it's it's feasible. One of the things HCD looks at when you develop realistic capacity in whatever community you're in is if you have a 100% affordability requirement, will anything ever develop there? And the answer here is no, because no one can afford to do it, not with your land prices being what they are. So again, this is a balance. Um, certainly, um, I've proposed in many jurisdictions doing a kind of in inclusionary program where the requirement is whatever's left in the arena, right? You have to do that proportionality. And that made a lot of sense to me. Um, none of my uh, county councils or city attorneys have ever agreed with me on that one. So um, I've never implemented it. And um, we did discuss whether we wanted to bring forward an inclusionary program in San Marino. Um, I, my personal feeling is that might be a little disingenuous because you just don't have a lot of opportunities for large enough developments to make that worthwhile. But you could have um, an, an inclusionary program and an in lieu fee that you applied that would help fund some of your other development. And so either they provide affordably and it's on site or they pay an in lieu fee and you, you know, you, you let a nonprofit uh, multiply that fund times 10. Okay, and I have one last question, I promise. Um, what about board and care facilities? I know we have some of those in town. I didn't see it in any of the graphics, but I'm, I'm sure you've already surveyed them and, and know. And is that something, because it's keeping an existing residence or historic home, the neighborhood is, is virtually the same, but now you might have um, a, a greater density, obviously, if you have that, particularly because some of our focus should also be on um, people with disabilities and seniors that might be more drawn to that type of housing and that also reflects um, or can accommodate lower income adults. Um, so I'm wondering how we can build that into our plan to answer some categories as well as in good faith that something that already exists here to some extent, but it definitely could continue given the size of our existing housing stock, you know, just the literal size instead of subdividing them, but actually making it a, a care facility for something. Um, so I wanted to see, can we be using those more aggressively in our community and um, promoting them and some putting in some things that might help people who want to convert to that type of uh, housing or multi-person housing, I guess it's multifamily, um, uh, in their, uh, of their homes? Absolutely, and a great question. It's, it's not multifamily, it's not single family, it's a community care facility is kind of the state definition of it. So sometimes they can count as, as multiple units and sometimes they do not. The difference is whether the individual bedrooms or whatever have a little kitchenette and a, a separate bathroom attached to them. So if you design them in such a way that you plug in one of those little you know, kitchens so that folks have the ability to do some cooking and food, it's food preparation, storage and cooking. Those are the things that, that make a kitchen. So if folks have the ability to do that in their rooms, it can count as a unit. Some of the population, we don't want to have those facilities in their rooms because it wouldn't be safe. So in those cases, it wouldn't count. Okay, and I think that's interesting because on the discussion last night, for example, in Pasadena, they are talking about converting, um, I don't know whether it's hotels or, or some spaces there, and they, all, they were talking about with a communal kitchen. So offering a communal kitchen with access that might be handicapped appropriate and safety, that's not enough for the units to count? Then why would Pasadena and other cities be um, going down that road for this RHNA meeting their requirements? If you have a SRO ordinance, a single room occupancy ordinance for things like converting hotel rooms, those are, those are being done under the new state programs, the Project Home Key, it was Project Room Key, and now it's permanent, it's Project Home Key, where they allow conversions of hotels and similar uses to individual housing units. Absolutely, those count, absolutely. You don't have any hotels to do that with, but you can certainly explore doing that in a large home in a single family zone if that's something that you wanted to look at. And so that, oops, sorry. And so that type of facility could count, but 
by converting a existing single family residence, do you have to add kitchens to each unit for it to count? Or is it some program that we would adopt as a city that would allow it to then be that communal kitchen concept? If you adopted a, an SRO ordinance, you could have the communal kitchens, but they don't count towards the um, they don't count towards the arena. They're a non unit They still count towards your towards your individual community needs and your quantified objectives, but they won't count towards your arena unless they have a plug in kitchen. Thank you. I think that's all I have for now. Thank you so much. And thank you both. That was really helpful education. Uh, may I move to Council Member Talt, please? Uh, thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, a lot of my questions were asked and answered through uh, Council Member Shepard Rami's questioning, but one of the principal questions I have, hold on, let me mute this. Uh, one of the, the principal questions that I have is the 397 uh, that has been dictated to us by the regional housing needs allocation. Is that set or are they still arguing over that number? That's set. And um, how does that compare to other areas? For example, what was South Pasadena's, you know? Uh, I, I could certainly look it up. I can, get, I can get you all of the surrounding ones if you wish. Um, proportionally, the one that went up the most was San Marino because you had one that was two. And then we when we added on what you hadn't accomplished the housing element before your it was 17. So so on a percentage basis, you guys are higher than anybody. I think Director Savant just has some numbers for us on that. Yeah, so South Pass is about 2,000 units. But proportionally, that is that's 2,000. Right. Um, the it, my my next question deals with. Uh, and uh, and I know you went through a lot of slides and so forth. Um, if if we were to go with a model that just allows um, townhouses uh, or uh, that type of uh, of co cottages in a certain area of town, and then uh, allow the zoning of a senior care facility. Um, a, in, in on an edge of town would that be sufficient for as long as it meets whatever numbers that we have or do we have to spread them throughout town that's a great question and i'm afraid i don't have a complete answer for you because the affirmatively furthering fair housing thing is brand new and we're the first uh, chunk of cities that are going through the sixth cycle to have this requirement um, Eight City has not come out yet with their guidance on how to do this. I've been talking to them and in San Marino, they've told me what they want because we don't have any areas that are, you know, poverty areas in San Marino. So they want a different kind of analysis. But spreading them throughout, throughout the community is what they are looking for, for a very high resource community like San Marino. But there are some caveats to that. We don't want to increase densities in areas that might be high fire risk and you have a locally designated high fire area where we wouldn't want to put those, even if it's the richest area in town, it might not be the right place to increase densities because of you know, troubles evacuating or something. So yes, they need to be spread out, but it also needs to be reasonable. And that realistic test comes up again. So if we put something, if we zone something in a neighborhood that's never going to happen, then it's not realistic. Oh, no. And, and I, I, I appreciate that. That's why where it's more likely to happen is, for example, along San Gabriel Boulevard, which gives them access to both shopping and the schools. Um, and uh, but, uh, you know, doing it on uh, uh, Oxford, uh, it just wouldn't make sense because it's not affordable. So I, I'm just trying to figure out the least, the, 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 what is going to be best for our community as a whole. And I'm not talking about best for, for housing, but best for what San Marino has traditionally been. Okay, I have no further questions. 
Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, Council Member Huang. Um, yes, um, my question is, um, if we increase the population density, would that help? Can you, can you clarify? Um, let's say uh, right now, like three per household, if we increase that to five or six, um, uh, would that help at all with this requirement? It, it won't. That, it won't. No, your, your household population is actually going in the other direction, meaning your household sizes are getting smaller and that's because of the aging population and less families. Um, certainly you wanna bring families back. So in that, in that aspect, it would certainly help, but it's not gonna help meet RENA numbers. Okay, and um, earlier you mentioned that um, uh, if we have any project, um, but then the cost is too high, and so nobody will be able to build it out. So let's say if we designate one area and then we have a project there, but nobody can afford it, would that count? Well, those are good questions. And it's really up to HCD. As I, as I indicated, what, so one of the things they want us to do is talk to developers and figure out what would work and then do that because they want it to be realistic. One of the, the biggest housing constraint that you have is the high cost of land and the lack of availability of land. You can't do anything about that. I mean, there's, there's no more land to just pull out of your pocket and you can't you know, bring down the high cost of land <clears throat> through any action that you as a government entity could do alone. So that's a non-government, or that's a non-governmental constraint that you can't do anything about. So they're not gonna hold that against you, but you still have to take it into account when you're deciding what's a realistic capacity. It, if you are willing to make a deal with a nonprofit developer to come in and build your whole arena, affordable arena on the Stoneman site, then great, you've taken care of the problem. But I don't know that that's what you want to do. And I think there are better ways to do it and to integrate it better into the community as well. Okay. So we're really I have looking no more for questions. mixed yeah. income. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Vice Mayor Jacobowski, may I ask a follow-up on uh, Council Member Wong's question? Sure. Um, Ms. Riley, I don't know whether it's in your recommendations or for another city um, that there is something that's a land lease program where the city can um, actually, if you will, either buy an, an affordable or whatever buy a property in the R1 or C1 and then um, be able to lease it to some nonprofit developers or, or person of our choice where we keep the land even and they can build or we build and then we run it as a rental or one of these other options of a multifamily. Um, how does that work and how would, is that built into some of your recommendations that we're seeing today and how would the city further develop that option? It is, and I'm super excited about this, <clears throat> this potential. It's called a housing land trust. And um, this is something that came up with the planning commission. And the, the idea is there's, there's a home that's put on the market. It's a smaller home, it's an older home. It needs some rehabilitation. It's not very big. And it comes on the market for let's say $700,000. And it's bought by a flipper and enlarged or, you know, taken down and rebuilt and it goes back on the market for $3 million. Well, that's not what we want to happen, right? We wanna see families be able to do that. So there is a program and I have multiple people trying to find out if there's one locally where you do a housing land trust where you own it, that land and you lease it back. You can charge, you charge for the full price of the construction of the home, but the land price is taken out of the equation. And that's the biggest part of your, your housing costs is the land price. So you lease that land back to the nonprofit or to the family that you built the house for, for a dollar a year for 99 years. And that way it keeps the cost down. You're able to keep some of those properties from turning over to flippers and you're meeting that housing need. So yeah, I'm real excited about that program. Um, you need to identify and fund it, but I highly recommend that you keep it in there as something to consider. If I'm not mistaken, I believe the uh, San Gabriel Valley Council of Government is starting to work on this and our city manager is nodding. Um, they're working very actively and getting, would you like to add more, uh, Dr. Marlowe? 
Chair, Vice Mayor, thank you. Um, the San, San Gabriel Valley COG has in fact been working on a regional housing trust program. It's actually not beginning. It's been underway for a couple of years. Uh, San Marino has not been part of that effort. If that's something that we want to look into, we can we can certainly consider what it would mean to join. There is a cost uh, associated with it. Um, and they are looking in that program to have partners who either have land or want to develop land. Um, and so we would need to decide which of those we would be. Obviously, I assume we would be the having land party, um, but if that's something that the council wants us to, to join proactively, we certainly can. And the COG is very proud of their efforts on that, on that front. Thank you, that's appreciated. Um, council member Huang, uh, do you have anything further? Uh, no, I don't, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I have um, a number of pickup questions as we've been going along this morning. Um, some very, very good questions have been asked. Uh, so for starters, and I think I know the answer to some of these, but maybe you'll surprise me and tell me otherwise. So our infrastructure issues, such as having a sewer system that is over a hundred years old, and trying to bring in more connections, if you will, in the community that would put more use on the system are having some streets that are narrow enough that they are having significant traffic issues currently. Neither of those can be taken into account in moving forward in terms of restrictions, if you will. Certainly infrastructure is an important discussion. <clears throat> um, our contacts with the, the sewer provider indicated that they had plenty of capacity. We didn't talk about the aging system. Um, that's something that all communities are facing, especially when at the age of San Marino. And I, I, I hope you're looking for some state money to assist with that. Um, as far as streets, certainly, um, but you have some of the widest streets. And so I don't know if there would be, a, I don't know that you could use street width as a constraint to development because there are a lot of communities which have much, much narrower streets than your most narrow streets. Um, unless, unless you're in a high fire risk area, and then it's certainly a constraint. Traffic is the traffic level of service is no longer allowed to be considered as a part of environmental review. It's all about vehicle miles traveled now. And yeah. So, um, yeah, so, so that part of the traffic is the bad news, but the good, I guess it's good news. Um, vehicle miles traveled are always gonna be higher in San Marino because you're, you're gonna be driving into the city and you don't have transit. So it's going to and be we have passed through traffic with people so coming much. from south going north. So much of it, so much of it. That's mm -hmm. that's a huge part of it. We need to find a way to make them pay their fair share for using your roads. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, the vehicles miles traveled is going to continue to be an issue, and that's going to be. I mean, frankly, when you do your general plan update or even the sequel work for the rezoning of housing sites. Vehicle miles travel is going to be the most expensive part of your EIR. It's an issue. And as I understand, COG also has a number of cities that have come together to work on that. And I believe Dr. Marlowe were part of that group on the, the um, VMT study. Yes, we are part of that group. Okay, so that should help a little bit. Thank you. Um, may I ask you, Jane, about similar cities to ours? Um, each city has a different footprint and uh, profile, but have you seen any innovative thoughts put forward that might be applicable to our city? Well, well sure. Uh, San Marino is unique in so many ways. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it's, I mean, frankly, it's like the 24th highest priced place to live in the nation right now. It's and and the fourth in this area. It's it's very mm -hmm. expensive, um, it, but but what's even more of a constraint is the lack of vacant sites and the small size of the sites that are vacant or or ripe for redevelopment. Um, I have seen similar, you know, uh, communities of high resources like yours that are small, you know, ten to twenty thousand population, do some of this mixed. Mix, missing middle 
um, cottage court developments where you can either do it as a rental or you can divide them up and they can be ownership units. Um, those have been popular. If you have long narrow lots, those are really a, a good way to go. And the development from the street still looks very quaint and single family. Um, certainly the interior conversions have been <clears throat> it's a great boon where they happen. Um, I, I wrote some of those interior conversion laws for um, Sonoma County a couple of years ago and we, they had exactly zero. So there wasn't like a big rush to do it, but they don't have nearly the pressure for housing as you do in San Marino. So yeah, I think there are some innovative things that you can look at and um, really focus on what you think you need to do to meet your needs, those young adults starting out, first time home buyers and seniors who are getting older. I mean, your senior group is getting older and mobility issues are getting greater. Thank you. Along those lines, are, as I understand it, what we need to submit by October is what we see as our plan. It doesn't mean that we have to start doing this immediately, but taking into account, for example, zone conversions and the like. Um, would it serve any purpose as we look at the build out, and maybe this is a question for both Jane and Aldo. I know that we've had the planning commission in this meeting to, to start to talk about this issue, but um, if we initially are having um, a little bit of an education here on internal conversions and even um, maybe more with JADUs, we're quite used to ADUs by now. Would there be any benefit to, if we will, survey the community more to see how many residents would actively consider participating in one of those three programs and to use that guesstimate, we know that's a small number. And we know that we also have um, rental costs involved that have to remain low or moderate. Um, how do both of you feel about that? You want me to start, Aldo? <laughs> so um, you have to, you have to adopt an HCD, HCD reviewed housing element by October 15th. So you have mm -hmm. to turn it in in June. Mm -hmm. You have to adopt oh. it after it's been, you oh. can't start public hearings until after HCD. But you're not committing, you're not rezoning any sites, you're not choosing particular sites, you're choosing sites to consider, but not to actually rezone. So yes, you have three years from the date the housing element is due to get those rezoning done. So you can absolutely do those community surveys. Mm -hmm. You can absolutely figure out what's gonna work best. And while you were talking, I thought about this other new phenomenon that's, um, that I've seen happen in a small town and that's the phenomenon of micro zoning. And that's when a neighborhood gets together and says, you know what we need here? We need to be able to do two ADUs on every lot or whatever it is that they that they decide they want to do because it improves their property values or whatever it is. And that's that microzoning is a concept that some cities are putting into use. And that gets you over the whole, you know, the whole problem with people not wanting what's happening in their neighborhoods if it's something that the neighborhood is asking for. So that's absolutely something that you could explore. I think the surveys are a great idea. Um, I wish more jurisdictions could do them, but what you're adopting in October needs to have enough of those consider this and consider that in it, that you will have plenty of flexibility when it comes to implementing those programs within the next three years. Uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yes, for our city attorney, please. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, we just, I, I've got Diana Vera. She's a housing expert attorney for my office here, and she just had um, one quick comment for a follow up on that. Thank you. Yes, thank Diana. You. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Jane. I have to say, one, that was one of the best presentations on a housing element workshop I've ever seen. So you guys are in very good <laughs> hands with uh, Jane and Four Leaf here. Um, and I just wanted to chime in to the extent that HCD is interpreting housing element law in conjunction with the Housing Accountability Act, there is some concern that once you put something in a housing element, even if your zoning code 
has not been updated to comply with or be consistent with what's in the housing element, there is an argument that you would be uh, obliged to approve projects pursuant to the general plan, meaning the housing element language. So I, I do want to note, and I think Jane is mindful of this, that what you put in the housing element um, has to be worded in such a way that it's not um, definite that you're doing this for this specific site. Otherwise, you could be bound to that. Um, but the balance there is that in order for HCD to allow you to use sites, they might require you to be more um, sort of specific. specific about what sites <laughs> you're using, how many units can be accommodated on those sites. So while I agree, um, Vice Mayor, that, that the community surveys is always an excellent uh, way to go, both with respect to implementing the housing element and engaging how effective the housing element will be in terms of um, producing the housing, I just wanted to note that that slight legal concern that once you put something in the housing element, um, even if you have not yet updated your zoning code, you may be obligated to comply with what's in your housing element. Thank you very much. Thank you. Director Cervantes, did you want to add to this question response? No, there's really no need after those two uh, comments. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, I 100% I agree, given the time that we have uh, three years to, to actually uh, implement some of these requirements, um, it does give us that, that benefit of, of outreach and education. But uh, as Diane mentioned, Diana mentioned, um, you know, once it's in a, an adopted document, you know, we, we set ourselves up for uh, potentially having to uh, abide by uh, those projects that come in during that timeline. Thank you. This is extreme, an extremely educational process. Um, and I, I think I may be close to my final question. I know um, some folks who have applied, for example, for board and care licenses with the types of restrictions we've talked about that would in effect make almost a JADU and all kind of licensing, even if it were to be a senior care facility is quite a lengthy process before the state. Would that be taken into account in our allowance of time if that is something we decide to go forward with? So the, the allowance of time is for rezoning adequate sites to, to meet your arena. So if you're looking at a program that you're not necessarily dependent on to meet the arena, um, and, and you're saying that it, it's already true that um, those uses when they serve six or more clients are already allowed in residential neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about something that's bigger than that, that you would allow under right. use permit. So if, if you're saying that we're going to open up the R1, whatever subcategory, to these kinds of uses because we have large homes and large lots and there'll be less impact on the neighborhood, then you've, you've already opened that up. You've already, you've done your rezoning by changing your zoning code to say that that's allowed in that area. And I, I just wanted to, to jump in kind of on the discussion that we're having um, about Kind of the timing and what you commit to. Um, I, I, I did help a community that was um, struggling to get out of litigation and a settlement with a, a lawsuit challenge um, and basically they were 500 units short or they were 400 units short and um, a lot of the sites that they had in inventory were um, uh, not, you know, they're at the bottom of a ravine or something like that, a steep hillside. <laughs> so, so they, they didn't really count. And what, what HCD accepted is we said, okay, here are all these sites that are, that are urban and they're big enough and we're going to consider every one of them for this housing overlay zone and we're going to adopt enough of them that we get to 500 units. And they were fine with that. Um, so then, then it was going through the period, but I tell you what, three years was a stretch to go through. I mean, that was tough to get through with uh, the community opposition around a lot of those sites. So that's, that's the kind of thing that we're kind of looking at. You have to have some level of specificity. You definitely have to have a unit target specificity. 
Um, but you can still consider on sites, but you have to give them some idea of where it's going to be. You can't say, we're going to find some sites after you guys look at our housing element. Thank you. And my final question to say on to what you had just said, um, there has been previous discussion about the possibility of looking, and, I, and Aldo is certainly, uh, Director Cervantes is quite familiar with this, um, at the western end of town on Huntington Drive, right at our boundary, we have two uh, single story commercial buildings that um, are not with much use at the moment, even though they are at our border, would it still be acceptable to look at those as being possible locations for um, multiple family dwellings? Hello? Well, that, that was weird. That wasn't letting me talk if I was sharing my screen. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we, we do have those in our preliminary inventory. We are listing those for a straight rezone to 20 units per acre. Okay, and, great. Um, we have had um, some interest, Aldo has had some interest expressed by a developer before, and that's going to really help make the case to HCD that that's an appropriate and realistic thing to do. Thank you. Um, I think we have finished questions um, from each council member. Um, so would it, uh, I'm sorry, for the, our city clerk, should we finish the entire um, issues of discussion and then move on to public comment? What would be appropriate? Um, I'm actually gonna toss it over to the city attorney. Does it, Stephanie, does it matter either way? If it's before or after discussion? It's up to the discretion of council as to how you would want um, to finish up this part of your discussion. You can obviously, if you if you would like, open it up for public input. Uh, since we still have, uh, we, we're leaving the questioning phase and moving on to comments. Um, should we see if there are any questions from the public at this point? Director Cervantes, do you think that would be the best best path forward and most efficient? Yes, given the recommendation of staff, uh, I, I do suggest that step two of this program is to open up for comments or questions from the public. Thank you. To our city clerk, are you seeing any of those at this time? Checking that right now, making sure I haven't missed any emails. Um, I do have one request via Zoom. Please. Uh, Mr. John Dustin, go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, council and uh, city staff. I just want to make a quick comment. Uh, Director Cervantes had asked uh, for um, some input uh, on the objective design standards that are currently under development. And um, I was just wanting to raise the point that, you know, my read of the Housing Accountability Act seems to show that if there were to be a proposal in town to demolish an existing single family residence and replace it with a new single family residence plus an ADU, the HAA would define that to be a housing project and therefore it would be required to be ministerially approved with only objective design standards. So I just think it would be uh, important that our objective standards sort of ac accommodate that possibility because it sort of would leave a hole where someone could really basically do a fairly large impactful project without any design review at all. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Uh, anything additional? I'm so, seeing no other requests for comment this time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, would it then be appropriate for us to move on to comments? Is that acceptable, Jane and, and Aldo? That is, yes, Vice Mayor. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I will start comments with Councilmember Huang. 
Um, where are you at this point? And uh, I know it's a big issue. Um, yeah, I just came down with this migraine. Um, anyway, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. No. Um, um, yeah, I'm baffled. Uh, I, I don't have any uh, answers. Um, I think uh, I think we have to depend on our staff to find some way out and hope somebody can save the city again. Um, yeah, uh, that for now. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Tall. I, I, I'm constantly disturbed by the efforts of our state to impose upon us some desire that doesn't really fit with what we're capable of doing, giving our city. However, if we're forced to work with it, then we're going to have to figure something out. Thank you. Council Member Shepard Rami. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, I also have a problem with the, um, the threats of lawsuit and losing local control if we're not doing a good enough job. So I, I think that's a big problem as well uh, that we have to consider as part of this whole process. Um, and one thing that we didn't speak about because it's not really a development issue so much as it's the uh, vacancy, the amount of vacancy of homes in our city and I think as part of this process, we really need to address that more aggressively because San Marino is actually suffering if um, homes are left empty and uh, that actually hurts us even more, both in terms of prices and our community. Um, so I believe that, uh, I think it, it was in some of the materials that really considering um, an increase in vacancy tax or, or costs, or I don't know, um, has to be adopted as part of this program, as well as a, an aggressive survey of what we have. I know the city is making uh, progress on that with the help of, of community members and our police department, but often it's, it's not still reflecting even the reality. And in the end that um, the loss of those houses hurts us the most. But um, I feel strongly that I'm, I'm not interested in this time at rezoning. Um, unless it's in a very micro limited, perhaps as, as was suggested, if a certain group in an area would want to do that. But I don't uh, believe I would like to see us achieve this just by rezoning because that our commercial areas or anywhere for that matter. I think we can um, really focus on infill and underutilized space that we already have in the single family residential areas, as well as some of these other ones and the ADU and JADUs, however you say it. Um, and also by limiting how many market rate conversions there are or um, how these uh, spaces are um, rented and really focus on meeting, uh, whether it's an inclusionary clause or however we wanna do it, but trying to get them spread across different um, income levels. And we should approach that quite aggressively from the beginning, otherwise, I think we're gonna be three years in and not have changed the needle much. Um, and I don't know if we will that way either, but I'd like to see us think of some creative incentives financially um, to help first time home buyers or these conversions into um, meeting the needs of those. And if it's the land trust route, I'm interested in exploring that. Although I um, have concerns about joining a larger conglomerate of cities um, I think that we might want to work with an attorney to figure out a program for San Marino um, since our needs in terms of housing as well as how to achieve that are going to be very different than some of our surrounding neighbors. But I, I you know, when we talked about the San Gabriel Valley COG, for example, I don't know how that, so we really need to have somebody look into that and consider whether we do our own independent program that's similar or maybe look to other more benchmark cities and see how they're approaching that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I will follow on a few of your comments, uh, Council, 
council member. Um, I think if we went to COG and simply looked at some of the templates that they've used, we are indeed very different, um, but they did a lot of work on the whole land trust concept initially, and a lot of the, the nuances might be helpful for us. And also to comment further on your vacant home uh, remarks, if we are being told today that we're uh, recorded as having 200, was it 207 empty? Um, I suspect that our actual number is probably higher than that since we really haven't accounted for all homes. And that too may be missed opportunity in the future. Uh, each one of those homes cannot be um, a prospect for an ADU or a JADU. Um, we certainly, in my opinion, would like to go as high as we can on that number because they are basically out of view and they serve a purpose. Um, I cannot um, agree further, uh, any further than what we have already heard. Uh, Director Cervantes, um, I think you hit the lottery when you found Jane Riley, and we are going to count on um, the two of you uh, really giving us the guidance. Um, I think council is capable of comprehending most concepts that you bring to us, but in part because this is so new and in part because it is so complex and so permanent, um, we really need a lot of guidance. So I think that will be a very important factor in going forward. With that, are there any uh, public comments that um, we are hearing uh, to this discussion or any hands raised, I should say? Communication. I'm, I'm not seeing any other requests for comments. Thank you. Uh, in our final step, is this correct, Director Savantis? You would like direction from us? That's correct, yes. On, on may, mainly the goals, policies, and objectives of one of the attachments, um, page starts on page 17 or 1 13, uh, whether we should go down the path of, of, of further analyzing those options and putting those in the draft document. Uh, can you can you speak just a little bit more to that in terms of how council may or may not want to go? It, it really comes down to, I would suggest um, looking at the various policies that are in that document with the checkbox inside or in front mm -hmm. and indicating whether a council member would like to see that move forward or and analyzed uh, and eventually, work into the housing element document as a draft um, and really indicating whether this is a right approach or the wrong approach. Uh, you will notice that there's an R uh, at the very end of some of these policies that are indicated as required by state mandate. So I'm not sure that there's a lot of options with respect to those, uh, but the ones that certainly are not addressed with the R symbol uh, uh, could uh, come down to a vote as to whether we uh, push forward on that. Now, even though we push forward on any of these options, of course, we will we'll address them in the next document. Uh, certainly, we can always go back and rediscuss them at a later point. But uh, uh, at this stage of the game in the housing element, we do need to start wrapping up uh, some of these objectives and policies uh, because we're getting down to the wire on the requirement to resubmit or to submit the, the initial draft for comments. Okay, thank you so much. So then drawing council's attention to page 18 of 72 or 1-14, where we have the policies and you see there the check marks that are listed. And as Director Cervantes has pointed out, some of the bold R's. Um, are we comfortable in going forward as this is presented or has anyone seen one any item on the three goals that they would like to address differently. Um, Council Member Huang? Uh, no, I don't have anything right now, thank you. Okay, uh, Councilwoman uh, Shepard Romy, please. 
Um, sure, I, I will go page by page, page 18. Sure. I had a question and a concern um, about policy 1.6 and 1.7. I don't know, um, uh, well, first of all, okay, 1.6, um, we talked a little bit about this. This is the, the second half of that statement involves uh, the percent of units that are affordable. Um, I would like to see that um, go up to 50% and include moderate or median, you know, make it a broader category, but so we are um, requiring a higher amount is spread uh, down, or, or at least half, are spread down through whatever strata would um, of the income levels, you know, so we can avoid, you know, if it's written at 20% affordable, then we're going to get 80% and mark or affordable to lower income, we're going to get 80% at market rate. And I really um, am concerned any developments under any of these things really need to be targeted half and half, or we will not meet our burden, because 240 of those units have to be, um, you know, uh, actually a very high percentage have to be in the lower income categories, more than normal cities might do. Um, about policy 1.7, I don't know enough about density bonuses and it's not defined here. We didn't talk about it today. So I don't know how that affects um, that. And I'm, so I'm not sure that I would include that, not it's being not, fully educated. That's uh, not a you, change. Do, do you want me also to address um, these when they come up, if there's <laughs> an explanation yes. or a reason? Yeah, as long as uh, that's okay with the vice mayor. Or certainly. wait till the end. How do you want to do it? I, I was going to uh, ask that, so this is a good time. Go ahead. Okay. Um, the policy 1.6 and the 20%, uh, that's, that's the bottom limit. And this is part of AB 1397. If we're using sites that were used in a previous housing element, then we have to zone them to be um, to be approvable by right if 20% of the units are affordable to lower income households. That said, let's go back to that thing about making the right way the easy way and let's do our own program that's better and easier for people to achieve um, that, that exceeds what the state is asking for, just what you asked for, which is um, a different threshold of affordability at a higher level. Um, 1.7 is an existing program in the housing element. All right, thank you. I wasn't sure. I didn't have a check, but then I don't know about density bonuses, so we'll leave that one alone. The state um, required program. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and so within that same goal, moving along, um, uh, on page 19, midway down, we are considering the second check area is consider adoption of a program to financially assist property owners in the development of JDUs and that type of thing. I would like to focus that again on our senior population or those that are low, moderate, low, you know, targeted again um, in providing financial incentives to those that should be our focus, you know, that you brought up before. Um, and even whether that's first time home buyers, I don't know how, but I really want to make it specific so that it's not uh, open to anybody who wants to put in a JDU, including, you know, market rate developments, because that doesn't happen. Um, again, help us. And we need to really um, help our existing homeowners, first time homeowners, you know, target these populations that we're going to have a tough time meeting. Right. Um, and also, I thought that was uh, the at the end of the page, program 1.4, um, I thought it was limiting. So by saying that the new construction and conversion from pool houses and other accessory structures, because we actually don't mind them converting the interior of a home. Um, so I would just take that out um, and just say interior and exterior conversions and, or something, um, if you're talking about drafting. Um, on the next page, Again, I am adamant that I do not want to see dual use or residential and commercial use on the same property. So I have a problem with the new program 1.5 and 1.6 as being part of our housing um, plans uh, because they both refer to mixed use. And again, it's not a defined term. I don't mind 
commercial mixed use of various commercial or mixed use of multi residential in our R1 zone. So we have multifamily, et cetera, et cetera, in these categories, conversions, ADUs, JDUs. But I don't want to start um, mixing our uh, zoning up and to allow everything everywhere. So that's why I had a problem with the phrase here and I would remove those terms. And um, as well, the last bullet point under 1.6, uh, there's a 20% um, of the affordability and I would like to see that raised to 50% and make that consistent throughout the document, you know, that we're really targeting um, and trying to do that. Um, additionally, 1.7 talks about an overlay can be requested by an individual property owner and I don't understand or would not put that in there because I don't, under, the implications are huge. It could be anybody anywhere in our city could ask for their own individual overlay zone. I don't, I don't understand this, so I would not put it in there. <laughs> um, and I guess the 1.8, the missing middle, I think you brought up an excellent plan and I have seen other cities that are focusing on this bungalow or the cottage courtyard developments. So if we are going to allow new developments, and I don't know how to phrase this, so I leave this to the experts uh, and Ms. Riley being our leader here, um, I would like to see that we emphasize that type of new development in our R1, if there's going to be any that are, that are um, separately owned or, and separately rented and that type of thing, then it should be designated that it's a, um, single story cottage bungalow that's consistent with the traditional or historic nature of our community. Um, and probably also, I believe um, we've talked with, or I've spoken with Director Cervantes in making these type of projects not in designated historic districts, because we do have some areas that we still need to keep preserved at the highest level. And so I don't wanna see um, new construction there. And I don't know if it goes in this place or somewhere else, but I want that to keep uh, in the forefront of our minds when we are allowing, um, you know, new development. Um, again, that 1.9 talks about the density bonus, and I don't understand that program, but or that law and its implications. So I would need more comfort about putting something new along those lines where we talk about we're going to be as least as permissive as the state. <laughs> I, I think we've heard from council member tall. We're really not going as permissive as the state, but we recognizing what's required. We will certainly do as far as density bonuses and that type of thing. Um, well, on, go ahead. May I, um, on, on the density bonuses, there's, there's a state required density bonus program and they've just added more parts to it and, there's a density bonus that you're required to provide with as little as 5% affordable. What I'm suggesting is that you consider something, you one up the state. I see. You consider something that says, yeah, you have to, if someone wants to do 5% at very low, we have to do a density bonus, but we're gonna give you a better density bonus if you do 50% at median income or something like that. That's what I'm suggesting. I see, okay. Have Thank it your way. I see, I see, I understand. Thank you. That helps. And then I don't have as much, well, and I don't know how to phrase that to make sure we're capturing that this is directed to our targeted, maybe we define targeted um, future homeowners and renters as seniors, low income, you know, uh, persons with disabilities, whatever is our group. And so we're directing these incentives to, to those first time home buyers we, we've spoken about. So, um, I think we need to target a group that we're underrepresented in and make all of these as a benefit for those groups, you know, in one definition. I don't know how you do it, but you're the author, you're the writer of these. Creative. <laughs> creative force here. Um, and I, I think we have to do, but it didn't mark with an, oh yeah, it's with an R, okay, 1.11. Um, and so I didn't have, as far as the, Goals number two, I think that that is all fine, except again, I think that the program 2.7 on page 22, um, this should be directed to our target group of the low, you know, or missing middle or seniors or 
persons with disabilities, you know, when we're um, trying to explore some land trust models, make it that it's directed toward our need population. Um, and then further develop uh, the program 2.8, which has to do with our vacancy tax and, and make a more um, robust statement about that, that we do have to make that as part of our focus over the next, uh, this building cycle to really deal with that and um, disincentivize, if you will, <laughs> and the Absolutely. proper way um, to go about that. So um, I wanna stress that that's an important and a great program. Um, as far as goal three, I don't think I had any, my only concern, if you look down 3.5, the universal design program, I looked it up on the state website and while it's very developed for AD, JDUs and ADUs, it seems extremely vague for homes, you know, for single family or, or, or multi-use type of um, multi-family development. And so I don't want to, until there's some, you know, it's literally fill in the blank. I mean, there's still brackets from what I can see on the state side. It hasn't even been written yet. So I hate for us to even put in such a thing about other development beyond JDUs and ADUs at this time, because I don't want to open it up because we, we be buying into something that we don't even know what, what it's going to look like or be. Um, so I would personally drop that for the time being. And if we have to, that would be something that we would add, you know, if at three years out or whatever, we're not making it. And by then it will be further developed because it's very vague. No. Okay. <laughs> this is this the states had nothing on this for at least 10 years so oh. universal design is not applicable to multifamily because those all have to meet americans with disability act ada which is a higher threshold and the state's program for universal design for subdivisions is this the developer has to offer universal design if the buyer asks for it that's it so again, I would say go beyond, make the right way, the easy way, incorporate it into the ADU, pre-approved ADU plans. Someone can pick that one or a different one. Okay. All right, so I have no problem with leaving it in for ADUs and JDUs. I just don't know then if we, I don't know what 3.5 is about, but okay. Okay. So that's it. Those are my comments on what we see here. And I, I don't know if that deals with some of the other bigger things. There are also other, things like the Southern California Home Financing Authority, first home mortgage or other plans that other cities are adding. Um, the first time home buyer assistance program through LA County. So I would like us to um, explore and include as much of those type of assistance and be actively um, promoting those on our website, et cetera, when we're you know, done with this, the Southern California Home Financing Authority. There's all these um, things out there along with the mortgage credit certificate program, which we list, but I do want us to further bulk up our offerings to help first time homeowners that I've seen out there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Council member tall. Uh, yes, I actually join in a lot of, uh, uh, council member Shepard Rami's, uh, comments and I, and I just, so I just want to add a few because I was confused by uh, some of the language, and that is in uh, policy 1.6. It says, uh, allow these units as permitted use of at least 20% of the project. And, and as uh, council member Shepard Rami suggested, that should be raised. But then it says subject to revi revised lot area requirements. I'm not sure what that means uh, because it, 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 it talks about something that's not defined. Uh, if someone could give me an update or an understanding of what that means. So one of the um, things that we talked about was being able to increase in commercial areas, the number of residential units that you can do beyond what's allowed now, which is 8.7 units per acre. If you wanted to use those to meet part of your arena, then you would need to get that density to 20 units per acre. In order to do that, you can either just straight rezone some of those sites, which is what I'm hearing um, so far you'd rather do, or you could reduce the um, amount of lot area that's required per unit. And that's where that revised lot area requirement comes in. If that's a no, then yeah. you'll just strike it. 
Yeah. I, I, that's a no for me. I, I prefer uh, doing it if we have to in zoning uh, very particular areas of the city uh, to allow for that. Um, I, I do not like waiving permit fees for the construction of accessory dwelling units and conversion of existing, exec, uh, which is under uh, program 1.2. I really do like, however, the penalty relief program to allow for conversion of unpermitted existing accessory units, as long as there's limitations to that, that you can't look at a garage and say this was unpermitted uh, and we're using it as a, as a bedroom, something like that. Uh, no, we shouldn't waive fees for someone violating the law to begin with. Um, I, I don't like uh, the last bullet pit point there, adoption of program to financially assist property owners in the development of uh, junior attached accessory dwellings through a loan uh, forgiveness program. I'm sorry, what um, item are you speaking on? It's, it's program 1.2, last bullet point. Thank you. Um, I, I join specifically in uh, Gretchen's objections to program 1.6. Uh, with regard to program 1.8, um, that is a great suggestion, but I would not, uh, I, I don't know if they spoke about other potential areas uh, for this other than the uh, single family areas to be considered include those in the first block of the mission commercial area. I don't know if they looked at, like I would suggest along certain areas of, of uh, San Gabriel Boulevard. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily limit that um, if there are other areas um, that, that, that would be, but I do like that. That's, that's an excellent idea. I, uh, um, I, I don't understand program 1.12 uh, if we're merely providing information, then that's fine. Uh, but if it, it takes a financial output on behalf of the city, then um, uh, then then I don't like that. Um, I like all the programs 2.1. I had the same question with regard to universal design program uh, that Gretchen did. Uh, and so that's been uh, answered. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, what I have heard so far is quite comprehensive and uh, covers most of what I would be uh, adding to this discussion. Uh, on program 1.2, um, as Council Member Talt just mentioned about not agreeing with removing ADU fees, I think we just got our um, draft packet and it did include a fee um, for ADUs for the first time. Is that correct, Director Cervantes? That's correct. Thank and you. and um, what do you remember? Was that amount something like seventy? Uh, do you remember the amount? Yeah, it was. It was a small amount. Nothing uh, that compares to, uh, for example, an entitlement request for DRC. It's significantly less. Yeah, so I, I similarly would approve. Um, there's always a lot of labor involved with our staff. And even though we support um, ADUs and JADUs, I, I would be in agreement that there should be a fee involved with that. Um, everything else sounds like it makes great sense. Um, oh, on that same item, 1.2. Uh, Director Savantes and I had talked about this before, and I, I fully support it. And again, this would be part, part of our marketing program later on, but under 1.2 third bullet, utilize pre-approved plans that have already gone through the city's building plan check process. You know, there may be some residents who would like an ADU, but are simply intimidated by building on their property. Um, and the whole process of going through that. So even material boards or whatever, again, we're not replicating up front, but what is in back of people's homes. And I'd really like to see us max out ADUs as, as much as we can. Um, and yes, I agree on 1.12. Um, I would like if 
at all possible for our staff labor to be minimal on that, but certainly to make programs available um, to others. Um, 2.8. Uh, as much as we can emphasize that about the vacancy tax, um, it would serve multiple purposes. And um, since 3.5 and 3.6 are required, um, I hope that we can get more bang for our buck with um, the existing plans that we already have in place, but if a developer wants to do it a certain way, they can. Uh, that finishes my comments. Um, are there any public comments that, um, or I'm sorry, uh, direction that um, we should be hearing? No, I think that the, the, the appropriate step is to ask if there's any comments from the public. Um, we'll go through that step, of course. And then thereafter, uh, I could conclude the presentation um, and uh, we'll go in those two two steps in that order. So um, I had uh, one other you... comment, Director Cervantes. Is that possible? Because I just saw. Of course. Of course, yes. Sorry, on page twenty four of the packet, there's a quantified ob objectives and there's a table. Um, and so in this table, I would remove. I believe it's the workforce mixed use. Um, line because I think that uh, the council does not want to um, have mixed uses referred it whatever in this document and so I just realized um, that that's included in our totals and so we have to distribute those in other ways. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you council member. Um, so yes, thank you for the direction director Cervantes. Um, are there any public uh, comments on the direction going forward. I do not currently have any requests for comment. Thank you. Uh, Director Savantes, would you like to wrap us up on this? Yes, thank you very much, Vice Mayor. And, and I wanna uh, uh, definitely thank the council. Uh, this has been a very uh, enlightening process and a very exciting one as well. I do appreciate all your comments. Uh, they, they help tremendously. Uh, allow Jane and I move in the right direction. I believe I, I, if I speak for Jane, I think we received the information that we're looking for, the direction that we're looking for. And so the next step is to really start looking at drafting the draft um, uh, administrative housing element uh, and really uh, uh, send that out for public review again. Uh, the, the whole, uh, uh, there's a, uh, an importance with outreach on this entire project as a whole. And I think that I appreciate the level of, of uh, public involvement as possible with this project because the state is gonna look at that and, and really see that as a high value. And so I do appreciate those steps taken at this meeting and prior meetings and meetings moving forward. So to conclude, I will say that I, I thank the council. I thank the members of the public uh, staff that also participated in this program and uh, we received direction we need and uh, we can now move forward. And uh, that concludes the presentation and uh, thank you very much. Thanks everyone. Yeah. And our greatest thanks to both of you. I know there was an extensive amount of work put into this. Thank you again. Uh, moving forward, uh, do we have any written communications or public writings for distribution at this time? We do not have any at this time. Thank you. Uh, moving to public comments. Is there anyone wishing to speak at this time? If so, please state your name and address for the record. As a reminder, the city council is not legally, is allowed, not allowed legally to engage in discussion on any items that are not on the agenda. Do we have any public comments? There are no requests for comment. Thank you. And are there any uh, items that the council would like for future agendas? Hearing none, uh, I close this meeting at 1028. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye.